Luke chapter 19. We're about to read what took place on what we often call Palm Sunday, the Sunday before Jesus' crucifixion. In Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 28, we read, when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethany and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples and said, Go into the village ahead of you. As you enter it, you will find a young donkey tied there on which no one has ever sat. You untie it and bring it. If anyone asks you why are you untying it, say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent left and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the young donkey, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the donkey? The Lord needs it, they said. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their clothes on the donkey, they helped Jesus get on it. As he was going along, they were spreading their clothes on the road. Now he came near the path down the Mount of Olives, and the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. And some of the Pharisees from the crowd told him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered them, I tell you, if they were to keep silent, the stones would cry out. As he approached and saw the city, he wept for it, saying, If you knew this day what would bring peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes, for the days will come on you when your enemies will build a barricade around you, surround you, and hem you in on every side. They will crush you and your children among you to the ground, and they will, know, they will not leave one stone on another in your midst, because you did not recognize the time when God visited you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this great day. We thank you for the testimony of Scripture. We thank you that we live in a place and in a time where we are allowed to have copies of your Holy Word. Lord, you promised that it would not return void. And Holy Spirit, we ask you this morning to empower, enrich the Word, use it to touch our hearts. Lord, please give me the words to say and do a work here in our midst today. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. By the way, Amen is not just a, a word we tack on to the end of the prayer, saying that it's over with, it's time to raise your head and open your eyes. Amen is a word which means, yes, I agree. And that is why often when we pray together, you will hear me when someone else is praying say, yes, or Lord, do this. Because the Bible says we're whatever two agree with on earth, God will do in heaven. And I want to pray with that person in agreement with them. Palm Sunday, this is the day being celebrated by many Christian churches today. Verse 37 says, Now he came near the path down the Mount of Olives. So the Lord Jesus is coming from the east. He's going toward the city of Jerusalem. He has come up from Bethany and he's right at the crest of the Mount of Olives. Right at the top of that mountain. Look there again if you will please in verse 37. Now he came near the path down the Mount of Olives and the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. And some of the Pharisees from the crowd told him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Jesus was about halfway down the Mount of Olives now. Verse 41. As he approached and saw the city, he wept for it. The Bible says that Jesus here, our Lord, is weeping he is crying and the word for weeping here doesn't mean just ordinary crying it means that he wept out loud he is convulsed he is broken great tears are coursing down the cheeks of the son of god his frame is heaving and loud groans and sobs are coming out of his heart 
He is weeping over the city saying in verse 42, If you knew this day what would bring peace, but now it is hidden from you. For the days will come on you when your enemies will build a barricade around you, surround you, and hem you in on every side. They will crush you and your children among you to the ground, and they will not leave one stone on another in your midst, because you did not recognize the time when God visited you. Look, the Christian life is to be a life of joy, unspeakable joy. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8, unspeakable joy and full of glory. The Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 4 that we are to rejoice in the Lord always. And someone has said that joy is the flag that is flown over the castle when the king is in residence. And I believe that the average church suffers from a saddening lack of old-fashioned, simple-hearted, overflowing joy. Jesus himself said in John chapter 10 and verse 10, I have come that they might have life and that they might have it to the full, that they might have it more abundantly, that they might have it joyously. I believe one of the greatest advertisements that we have as a church is not what we put on the signs at the end of Garfield, but the joy of the people when you go to work on Monday morning and the joy of our worship when we come together to worship on Sunday mornings. Now, if you're not a joyful Christian, I don't believe you're a good testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we come to church on Sunday, we don't come to mourn a defeat. We come to celebrate a victory. And I want us to have that kind of joy. I'm not talking about cheap thrills. Sin has thrills, but it doesn't have joys. Those who live in sin, when you analyze them, are the saddest people on the face of the earth. But let me tell you something, not only was Jesus a man of joy, but he was also a man of great sorrows. Jesus was a man of tears. Three times in the Bible it is recorded that Jesus wept. First, he wept at the grave of Lazarus. Those were tears of sympathy. And if you've been to the graveside and wept, it's all right. You're like our Lord. And when you weep, I want, you, I want to tell you that Jesus weeps with you. And when you hurt, He is hurt. He is touched by your feelings of pain. Jesus wept tears of sympathy. Second, when He was in the Garden of Gethsemane, He wept tears of agony. He prayed in an agony of spirit. The perspiration became like drops of blood and He wept. And the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, with strong crying and tears, He cried out to God. I can picture Him there. in the garden, crying great tears of agony, begging his father to take the trials away from him. Jesus wept tears of sympathy, and he wept tears of agony. But at this time, I believe he is weeping tears of urgency. Jesus looks down at the city of Jerusalem, and he knows what's coming for that great city. And his great heart is broken. And Jesus weeps. Now why am I preaching this message this morning? I tell you why. Because my dear friend, what breaks the heart of Jesus ought to break your heart and mine. Whatever moves the heart of the Savior ought to move your heart and mine. Let me give you some background here. The Lord Jesus, just the week before his crucifixion, he's coming into Jerusalem in what's um, called the triumphal entry. We see him coming as our king. But Jesus, our Lord, humble as he was, came on a borrowed donkey, the symbol of humility. When Caesar came into Rome, Julius Caesar when he was pulled into Rome and his triumphal entry into the city, he came in a beautiful carriage pulled by 40 elephants. And when Mark Anthony, when he read about what happened to Julius Caesar, when Mark Anthony came into Rome, he came into Rome with a chariot pulled by magnificent lions. But Jesus comes riding on a donkey in fulfillment of prophecy. 
And just as he comes over the crest of that hill and he sees the city, Jerusalem, the Bible says he was convulsed with anguish and tears of urgency. Why did Jesus weep over Jerusalem? The same reason we weep over Enterprise and Deltona and Deberry in our communities. Let me give you three reasons to right here in the Bible why Jesus wept and why you and I should indeed. First, Jesus wept over their surface only religion. Look there again, if you will, please, in verse 37. Now he came near the path down the Mount of Olives, and the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Sounds like they had some kind of camp meeting to me. Some kind of old-fashioned revival meeting. Sounds like they had some kind of great religious service. I mean... If you want enthusiasm, that would be enthusiasm. If you want a praise service, that was a praise service. They had religion, but it was all superficial. It was all on the surface. That was the same crowd, the same crowd that was throwing their clothes on the ground in front of him. That same crowd that was waving the palm branches. That same crowd that was saying, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. That same crowd that was saying, Hail Him, Hail Him, in one week would be crying, Nail Him, Nail Him, let Him be crucified. The same people, I mean, they were going to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And what was the Passover all about? It was all about the Lord Jesus, the Lamb of God. Passover is a picture, a prophecy, a portrait of Jesus. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Get rid of the old yeast so that you may make a, a new unleavened batch as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. This whole week was about him. And yet he would be judged, spit on, rejected, neglected, and crucified. We see what Jesus said right after he came into the temple on this same day. If you look down in verse 45. Look there please. In verse 45. And he went into the temple and began to throw out all those who were selling. And he said, it is written, my house will be a house of prayer. But you have made it a den of thieves. Jesus saw their religion. And he saw their ceremonies. And Jesus heard their praise, and he knew that it was all superficial, not supernatural. And it caused him to weep. Did you know that our area is an area of churches? We live in the south, where in many places there are churches on every corner. But God forgive and God forbid so much of our religion in our cities is absolutely superficial. Jesus warned about it in Matthew chapter 7 verses 22 and 23. He says, on that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Drive out demons in your name and do many miracles in your name. Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. It's not that they had salvation and lost it. They had religion, but they didn't have the Lord. Most of the people in America don't need religion. They need Jesus Christ. I want you to know how they had false praying. They said, Lord, Lord. They had false prophesying. They prophesied in His name. They had false power. They cast out demons in His name. They had false performance. They did mighty works. They sang in the choir. They sat on the platform. They took up an offering. They gave. They did all of those things. They taught Sunday school or the counterpart of it. 
But Jesus said, I never knew you. Oh, would there ever be anything more devastating to hear from the lips of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? That after spending a lifetime in church and going through the motions to have him say, I never knew you. Now my friend, religion without Jesus is not only useful, useless, it is sinful. He calls it iniquity. He calls it sin. And if Jesus, if he were to come into our area, he would weep over their religion without reality over many of our churches superficial religion and i want you to examine your heart because jesus said not everyone that saith unto me lord lord shall enter into the kingdom of heaven and as surely as i'm standing here tonight there are some of you who are baptized pagans you give your tithe you attend church, but you've never met Jesus. Do you know why popcorn pops? Inside that kernel of corn, there's a little drop of water. And when you put that bag of microwave popcorn into the microwave and you turn it on and it starts heating, what that microwave does, it doesn't actually heat up the corn. It begins to heat up that little drop of water inside the kernel of that corn. And after a while, the microwave heating up that little drop of water inside the kernel of the corn, it begins to boil that little bit of water until that turns into steam. And it becomes so pressurized that that kernel explodes. And the whole form of that thing has changed because of what took place on the inside. It's what happens on the inside that changes the outside. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things were passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Some of you are trying to dress up the outside, but you have not addressed the inside. You have the process backwards. You heat up the inside. You get Jesus on the inside. You let the Holy Spirit fill the inside. And that changes everything. It is not cleaning up the outside. It is transforming the inside. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 5. Paul writes, test yourself to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you yourselves not recognize that Jesus Christ is in you unless you fail the test. Jesus Christ would look down at a congregation like this one and many congregations in America. And I believe that great salty tears would roll down his cheeks. Because he would say, there are those among you. Your religion is just on the inside. It's not changed anything here at all. Let me ask you, my friend, is Jesus changing you? Jesus looked over the city of Jerusalem and he cried. He said, for so many people in this city, everything that they call religion is just that. It's religion. Something painted on the outside. Not even beginning to touch the inside. Jesus looked over the city that day, I believe, and wept over passing opportunity. I'll tell you another thing that broke the heart of the Lord Jesus that day. It was not only superficial religion, but it wept over Jerusalem because of the opportunity that was passing. This was a day of golden opportunity before them. Never, ever had they, as a people, had a greater opportunity than was theirs that day because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was there in their midst. Look there, if you will, please. Verse 42. It 
saying, if you knew this day what would bring peace, but now it is hidden from, from your eyes. Oh, what an opportunity. There was the King of Kings, the Lord Jesus Christ, coming into their city wanting to bless them. What a day of opportunity was theirs. But they missed it. Why did Jesus Christ say this day? Well, you see, that day had been prophesied for over 400 years. If you were to read the ninth chapter of Daniel, you would find one of the most remarkable prophecies in all of the Bible. In the ninth chapter of Daniel, Daniel prophesied that the Messiah would come in 483 years from that particular date. And that particular date was from the date the command was given to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. The command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem was given by Arxaxerxes, the king, on May 14th, 445 B.C. Now the Bible teaches, therefore, that in 483 years, in a biblical year of prophecy is 360 days. If you stretch that out and multiply it, in 173,880 days, Messiah would come. Now my friends, historians and Bible scholars, folks much smarter than I have worked this sound and they have studied the calendars and they have calculated and they can tell you that Jesus' triumphal entry in Jerusalem was on April 6, 32 A.D., exactly to the day the prophet Daniel had prophesied when the Prince of Peace would come. Now in a moment he's going to talk to them about judgment. But before God sends judgment, God always sends opportunity. But an opportunity missed causes God to weep. In Jeremiah's day, Jeremiah saw judgment coming like the Lord Jesus saw judgment coming. And Jeremiah had preached to the people of Judah. And the people of Judah had been warned again and again by the prophet of God to repent or judgment would come. But they would not listen to Jeremiah the prophet, the weeping prophet who wept like his Lord. Then the Babylonians came and the Babylonians laid siege to Jerusalem. And they put their armies round about the walls of Jerusalem and they cut the people off from the ripening fields of grain. The harvest was out there. It was in the summertime and the harvest was there. But no one could go outside of the city because they simply sealed the city off. They called that laying siege. And then finally, Jeremiah the prophet stood up and his words were recorded in Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse 20. With tears coursing down his cheeks, the weeping prophet said, The harvest is past. The summer is ended and we are not saved. In other words, there was a time, but now it's too late. Starvation stalked the city. The Bible tells us the mothers cooked and ate their own children. The starvation in Jerusalem was so severe. Before judgment, God offers mercy. Before judgment, God gives a time of harvest. But if men will not take that harvest, as we're going to see, judgment comes. In Noah's time, God didn't just send the flood. God gave the people of Noah's time 120 years. And Noah, the man of God, preached with the ring of the hammers in the foreground and the wrath of God in the background. And Noah pleaded and pled and said, Repent for 120 years. But then the harvest passed and judgment came. My friend, the harvest time is here for America. The harvest time is here for the church but harvest does not last forever. Opportunity passes. The harvest of youth passes. If I had small children in my home, I'm talking about old enough to know the difference between right and wrong, I would do all that I could do to lead those children to Jesus as children. I would not wait until they're teenagers. I would bring them to Jesus. See Wade Freeman, who is now deceased, was the director of evangelism for the Tex Texas Baptist Convention. He did a survey. He received over 10,000 replies of Baptists and people who had been saved, and he asked them, 
How many of you were saved after you were 20? Out of 10,000, only 8% were saved after they were 20. Practically all of them had been saved before they were 20 years old. Statisticians tell us that more than half of the people who are saved are saved before they are 15 years old. I praise the Lord. The next Sunday we will be baptizing Danny, his parents and grandparents. That's a rarity. A while back I was talking to a young mother, a mother of two young girls. I asked her if they were in church. She said she didn't want to pressure their children, didn't want them to force them to go to church like she had been forced when she was a child. Parents, you'd better wake up. Sometimes parents say, well, I don't believe in pressuring little children. Well, I don't believe in pressuring little children either, but I do believe in encouraging little children to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And sometimes we fail to reach our children and then when the boy is 15, 16, on drugs or values, they come to the pastor and they say, won't you do something about our son? We can't do anything with him. Lead him to Jesus when he's a child. And I don't mean just get him baptized. I mean lead him to Jesus. Get him spirit-filled. Help him to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You say, well, he's not old enough. My dear friend, a 10-year-old child, according to psychologists, knows half of all he'll never know in his lifetime. When he's 10, when he's old enough to know that he's a sinner and that his sin is against God, he's old enough to be saved. Part of the problem is that parents can't pass on what they ain't got. They can't pass on what they haven't caught themselves. And grandparents... If your children aren't taking care of things, you do it. Don't undermine your children. Don't undermine your, their parents, but teach your grandchildren. A good friend of mine and one of the greatest prayer warriors I've ever known was discipled by her grandmother. Why in the world do you think we spend so much time trying to reach and impact children and youth? Why in the world do you think Gladys often spends an hour or more a day working on 4 eight stupid paperwork and coming down here and filling chicken waters when parents are too lazy to care? Why in the world do you think we had adults from other churches in the lake this past Friday night, adults who were shivering from the cold, teaching children how to canoe? It's not because... The children tithe and pay the bills around here. It's not because they can build buildings. It's not because they carry a portion of the load around here. It's because 92% of the people who become Christians do so. Before they're 20 years old. I'm telling you my friend that Jesus weeps over every passing opportunity. And not only the opportunity of youth, but the opportunity of Holy Spirit conviction. I was 12 years old when we moved down here. We moved down here just before school started. When we moved here, the house was not finished. We had a bare concrete floor downstairs, a plywood floor upstairs. There were no interior walls, no insulation. The only thing between us and the outside was the masonite siding nailed on the outside. The only heat we had in the house was the fireplace. And that first winter was unusually cold. It was my brother Dusty and my responsibility to keep the wood box full. At the time, my dad thought we were too young to use the chainsaw. So the majority of the wood we cut, we had to cut with an axe. It didn't take me long to discover that the time it was the easiest to cut firewood was when it was green and full of sap. For the longer it sat there and the longer it dried out, the harder and harder that wood would become. 
some of that wood that had sat there for a while was nearly petrified and almost impossible to cut. What is true of that wood is also true of you and I. The Holy Spirit prompts us, He convicts us, He calls us. And the sooner we respond and the sooner we obey and repent, the easier it is. But the longer we wait and longer we still the, the still small voice of the Holy Spirit and the longer we tell Him no and the longer we make Him wait, the harder and harder our hearts become. Some of you become so good at quieting that still small voice that it hardly ever speaks anymore. And you can barely hear him when he does. My friends, when we procrastinate, when we neglect that still small voice of the prompting Holy Spirit, we grieve and quench the Spirit. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3, the Lord says, My spirit will not strive with man forever. In Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 6, the Bible says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found, and call upon him while he is near. Life itself is passing away. This may be the last service you'll ever be in. The fact of death is certain. The time of death is uncertain. The only thing that can interrupt death is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus looked at the city of Jerusalem and he cried. He cried over their superficial religion that they had painted on the outside. He cried over their mist opportunities and he cried over their coming judgment he cried over the judgment to come Jesus with prophetic vision looked down the road just 65 years at this time there was a time of peace in the Roman Empire. The greatest peace the empire had ever known. It was a time of peace and prosperity for almost all of the peoples living in the Roman Empire. But just 65 years down the road, the Roman armies would come and besiege the city of Jerusalem. Historians tell us at that time there were more than one million Jews trapped within the city. They besieged the city and finally the Roman army breached the walls of the city and they were so angry with this people that had resisted them for so long that they just began cutting down trees and crucifying people. Cutting down trees and crucifying people. The Bible tells us that they crucified so many people that they ran out of trees in the area. <laughs> Jesus looked down over the city and he saw the judgment that was going to come on these people because of their disobedience, their rebellion. And he cried because he knew what was coming. My friends, can you read the newspaper? Can you not tell the signs of the time? Can you not tell the urgency and the emergency of these days in which we live? But we come and sit in church like this on Sunday and it seems like the world is this way. But my friend, this is a wicked world. I cannot even describe the things I've been reading about the God hate that is in our world. And America is ripe for judgment. And God is going to judge America. And our generation is blind to danger, death to God, and sure for judgment. And Jesus weeps over America. The judgment may be closer for us today than we ever realized. 
I believe that if Jesus were to stand in this pulpit today, that he indeed would just weep and say, Oh, America, you are a land of superficial religion. America, you are a land of missed opportunity. America, you are a land of coming judgment. Jesus looked over the city and he wept. Now there ought to be a time for tears. Psalm 126, verse 6, we read, He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come forth again, rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Does what breaks the heart of Jesus break your heart? When was the last time you shed a tear over some soul that was mortgaged to the devil? The Apostle Paul said in Acts chapter 20, verse 31, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Do you know what's missing in the average church and God help us in this church? Tears. I'm not talking about crocodile tears. I'm talking about tears. General Booth was the founder of the Salvation Army. He was a great man. One of the leaders, one of the superintendents in the Salvation Army wrote General Booth and said, you've got to help us here. And this particular division of the Salvation Army said, we are praying, we are teaching, we are witnessing, but we're not having revival. We're doing everything we know to do, but we're not having revival. What should we do? They wrote the old general and he sent back a telegram, just two words, try tears. Charles Finney used to say, we'll never have a revival until Mr. Amen and Mr. Wet Eyes are back in the pew. Souls are in the balance, my dear friend. We ought to be singing and praying with urgency and tears and fervently. Do you believe that souls are in the balance and do you my friend know which side of that balance you are on if you've never made a profession of faith today if you've never invited jesus christ into your heart and soul to be your lord and savior i implore you today please my friend will you today pray lord please forgive me of my sins and come into my heart to be my lord and savior and you Christian brother and sister, if you look at your family, as you look at your neighbors, do you pray over them with tears or would you pray this morning, Lord, please break my heart for the things that break you. Please help me to remember what is in the balance. Lord, let, help me to pray like we mean business. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, this week we call the Passion Week. We remember your triumphal entry. We remember the Lord, first Lord's Supper. We look and remember the crucifixion when you paid the price for all of our sins. And we look forward to next Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, when you rise again. But Father God, all that you sent your Son to do is of no worth and of no value. If we do not take advantage of the gift you have made available to us ourselves, Lord, help us to become Christians. And Lord, that great sacrifice will mean, no, mean nothing to our family or to our neighbors if we do not tell them. Help us to be faithful witnesses as well in the name that is above every name in the name through which our salvation comes in the name of our lord and savior jesus christ we pray and all god's people said amen, amen. i'm glad you came i hope you are um